Hello, welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Phil Price, and uh, Phil is an enrolled agent, and uh, he has his own company called The Price Company. They provide uh, retirement plan services for small businesses in Northern California. Um, Phil, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. So Phil and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, retirement plan alternatives for closely held businesses. And uh, as we get started, I just want to caution our viewers that uh, this is actually uh, quite an involved area when you really get into the details. And so you really need a consultant to support you with this. And so uh, that's what pe keeps people like Phil in business. So let's go ahead and get into some of these questions. Phil, why is retirement planning important for the owner or owners of a closely held business? Uh, well, there's a few different <laughs> things that come up. Um, employee retention is mm -hmm. one reason somebody would put a plan in. Uh, today's marketplace is very competitive as far as getting good employees. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of times we've put plans in because the employer wanted to add an additional benefit so that they could get better employees. Um, in a small business, it's a way for an owner to be able to put away profits um, to their retirement mm -hmm. and um, then have that when they do get to retirement age and mm -hmm. get out of the business or mm -hmm. sell their business. Mm -hmm. um, there's tax deferred growth. Mm -hmm. um, the money that goes into the plan is not taxed while it's in the plan and um, that way it grows quick, quicker than it would if it was outside um, mm -hmm. outside the uh, retirement plan. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, sort of like, what, what's it all about? You, uh, with an IRA, you're limited to, what, $5,500, something like that? Yeah, and I think you can get an extra 1000 if you're yeah, over, over 50, 50 yeah, something and, like that. And so, you know, so the limit is quite a bit lower, about a third of what it would be uh, if, for example, you put together a 401k. Right, so. right. And, um, yeah, and in fact, the cost of living adjustments have come out. And uh, since there was no cost of living adjustments, <laughs> the limits that were for 2015 <laughs> or for 2016. Yeah, so basically so. We're gonna, we have the same uh, limits as we had uh, for 2014. <clears throat> Excuse me, for 2015. Okay, so... Uh, what are the basic types of qualified retirement plans? So these are the plans for which um, businesses can get a tax deduction uh, right. as opposed to non-qualified plans. So, uh, Well, you, I mean, there's one type of plan. Is a, it's called a SEP IRA. Yeah. Uh, it's not a qualified plan. Basically, it's a and basically an employer-sponsored IRA, yeah. although they can put higher limits in than what an individual can do in an IRA. There are um, profit-sharing plans. Mm -hmm. um, there's a 401k plan. A mm -hmm. 401k plan is a type of profit-sharing plan, actually. Mm -hmm. um, there are what's called a money purchase pension plan. We don't see those very much anymore since limits have changed. Um, and there are defined benefit pension plans, which are your classic company retirement plan that people talk about when they retire and get their pension in the gold watch type of thing and it plays a monthly benefit at retirement is how it's designed. Right, so the defined benefit plan is sort of your father's or grandfather's retirement plan, you know. Yes, for big corporations yeah. and some big corporations still have them although a lot of them have shifted to yeah. 401k well, most plans. Most everybody I think has gotten out uh, because the, the defined benefit plan became so expensive uh, for them to maintain. But on the other hand, like for a, as we'll get into a, a little farther down the road, but you know, like for example, a, a doctor or a dentist that maybe hasn't funded much retirement before and they're getting up there a little bit, they can actually shovel a lot of money into one of these. Yes, they can. That, that's where it's good that it's expensive <laughs> because for a um, smaller business, it's expensive for the owner, yeah. but the owner's the one that is, um, you know, benefiting a lot from that. Okay. And some of these, I guess, you can actually mix and match. So you can have, you could have, for example, a combined. Uh, you could have a defined benefit plan, and you could have a, a profit sharing plan in a business. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so, uh, and you can have a combination four hundred one k profit sharing plan. Correct. And so yeah. forth. So, uh, so there is a little mix and match here. 
Uh, now, how do you go about having one of these retirement plans created? Um, well, you have to have a plan document where you set down all the different parameters uh, based on the rules that the Internal Revenue Service um, gives everyone. Um, and that's where you pick how, who's eligible, who's not, who gets a contribution, what the contribution amounts can be, um, how people are distributed out, um, different things like that, you know, how are things valued, basically all the different types of rules around a plan and you have a plan document for that that where an employer can pick and choose from the options that are available. Right. And if I got this in here. So what's what's the difference of uh, working with a company like yours as opposed to going to say Merrill Lynch or uh, it's hard for me to keep track for who's who's around well. these days. So anyway, uh, uh, what, what is the, uh, the difference of working with, with a company like yours as opposed to what, like a brokerage company or, or something else? Well, we're completely independent. We work with a lot of different people, uh, a lot of different brokerage houses or mutual fund companies or vendors for 401k plans. Um, and we also, the documents that we use are our documents that are approved by the IRS but they give you the full gamut of everything that you can do under the law. Um, if you have a document from a, and you can't get documents from a brokerage house, mutual fund company, but a lot of times they will have limits in there as to what options you can choose from um, because uh, they don't wanna have to necessarily manage all the different variations that are there. It makes it easier for them to take care of things, um, but it does limit a client as to what they can and can't do. Um, you know, say you wanted to invest in real estate, which is something you can do in a plan. You're not going to be able to do that if you're with a, a financial institution's plan because they only want you to invest at their particular financial institution. Uh -huh. So Okay. So one, you may be limited as to the types of investments that you can make. Another is, is that uh, that your plan can be customized uh, more for your business. Right, ours is customized. Again, we can take advantage of all the options under the law. I do know of certain uh, financial institution plans that say don't allow a participant loan mm -hmm. uh, because they don't want to have to worry about administering that, um, whereas our documents do allow for things such as that. That could be a good thing and that could be a bad thing. <laughs> well, yes, it needs to be managed properly, <laughs> okay. but uh, there is times when, you know, it's, it's, it's a good option to have in a plan. Okay. What are the uh, non-discrimination and top-heavy rules and how do they interact with plan administration? Well, um, there is testing that has to be done, um, and that's something that we provide in our annual service. And most of the time what we're looking at is comparing uh, the benefits or contributions that are highly compensated, and there's a definition in the IRS code for that, compared to non-highly compensated or regular common law employees. And the rules are so that um, it falls within the parameters the IRS sets down in the regulations um, and that the employees are taken care of, you know, properly and at, at certain minimum benefits and things like that, so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so there are technical details that, that can require testing but there are, I guess, some shortcuts that are available, right? So where employers well, you, make like a minimum contribution or something? Right. And in the 401k plan world, there's what's called safe harbor 401ks. Mm -hmm. And there's two different safe harbors, which is a promised contribution. It's not a huge contribution, uh, but it's a promised contribution. And what that allows um, is that the 401k test, and in some cases the 401 match test, 401M match test, um, are able to uh, pass mm -hmm. uh, because you've made this promise and you do fund those. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about the testing. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk a few minutes about, you know, what, what are some of the things, uh, the developments that have happened, uh, uh, say in the past few years, whatever, more recently, uh, that, well, that you one of the, impacting these plans. Right, one of the big issues that you'll see all over the place is the new quote unquote fiduciary rules, um, which are aimed generally towards the investment community mm -hmm. about how advice is given um, and whether or not a, uh, an advisor is a fiduciary, which carries certain obligations and liabilities. Um, and there's pretty much a big fight going on in DC. Mm -hmm. The Department of Labor has put out the rules. 
There is different influences in Congress. There's different bills in Congress to remove it, curtail it. Not quite sure how that's all going to play out, but it's, it's a very large issue right now. Um, one of the new things that just came out was the new Form 5500, which is the return for plans. And the Eternal Revenue Service, um, I like to call it, it's kind of a back to the future type mm -hmm. thing. Um, years ago, there was a whole bunch of questions that were taken out of the form when the Department of Labor took over, and now they're being added back in. Questions about ID numbers for the plan. Um, is your document up to date? Um, mm. <laughs> with the testing you just described, mm -hmm. you know, was, is that testing, you know, has it been passed and those types of things. So um, it's optional for 15, but that means that probably in 16 it's going to be permanent. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the work that we do is now going to actually end up on the, um, on the return. So it's important to make sure all those things are taken care of. Right. So these things aren't, uh, these plans aren't trouble free. Um, so well, maybe talk a little about the, the administration part because what, what I've found is, um, particularly with the smaller businesses, sometimes people aren't as attentive as they should be. Yeah, and getting these reports done and so forth, and there can be pretty severe penalties from doing that. That's true. Um, even I, at this point, mm -hmm. have um, two clients who still haven't sent me their information for 14. There's a $25 a day penalty the IRS charges for not turning the form in on time, so you do need to make sure that that's taken care of. Um, uh, Department of Labor, if it's a larger plan, can require audits if you have over 100 participants, and those have to be turned in timely also or there's uh, big penalties for that. But that's part of what we try to do is to make it, um, I guess, as painless and as easy as we can for someone um, to be able to take care of those obligations. That's, we're there to help. Okay, yeah, so the, I guess the important thing is go get that help because, I mean, this stuff doesn't happen by itself. You know, you just don't open a bank account and it's there. Now that is sort of an advantage of the SEP, okay? Yes. It, it's sort of self-administered, except for one thing, and that is that you have to make sure you put in the right amount for the for the Yes, employees. you have to do the numbers right so and cover the right number of people. But the downside of a SEP can be that once the money's funded, it's in someone's IRA, yeah. and then that individual can actually take the money out and go spend it. Now they have to pay penalties yeah. and taxes, yeah. but then they're not saving for retirement, whereas in a qualified retirement plan, um, there's rules about when they can take distributions. Right. So, and then there's the other thing that with a SEP, um, everybody has to get the same, you know, as long as they meet certain, certain requirements. So in other words, the employee is getting the same percentage as the owner. Correct. Whereas uh, in some custom design plans, you can uh, have some uh, leeway as far as uh, possibly favoring Correct. certain employees and so forth. Correct. Correct. And that's, again, reason, part of the reason for having some custom plan design done. <clears throat> Correct, yes, that, that way. In fact, that's how we're setting up all our plans is to basically set it up as complete wide open options as to how they want to um, make contributions and they can do it at different levels for different employees. Um, so what's, what's been happening on the front related to the same-sex marriage thing? Has that been a real headache? Well, it can be a headache mm -hmm. depending on the plan document that it was used. Mm -hmm. um, if the plan document defined what a spouse was um, and defined that under DOMA, mm -hmm. which was, you know, a man and a woman, then yes, it, um, there were um, amendments that had to be done. And interestingly enough, they would have to be done for years before because that's the way the court ruling was. Mm -hmm. Our particular documents only list the word spouse, there's no definition of what a spouse is. So at least for ours, and I'm sure there's other similar documents that did that, um, it was not that much of a problem. But uh, it's a document issue. Yeah, well, I mean, there, I know that there were some issues of, okay, well, wait a minute. We had uh, a married couple here, but they didn't fit under DOMA, and so the benefits may have been paid to the wrong person. 
That's a possibility. And so far as what I've seen in my, um, in, you know, the literature I received, <laughs> um, I haven't seen that the IRS has come up with a solution about how to deal with what happened in the past mm -hmm. when monies have already been paid out. Same thing would happen with death. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, the wrong beneficiary could have been paid out. And ideally, it would have been good for, you know, people to have put down their spouse, um, uh, no matter what the sex, um, as their beneficiary. That would have at least in that situation been distributed properly. Yeah. Can we talk for a moment about, and you may have to ballpark, I don't know, you may, I don't know if you have the figures in your head or not, I don't. <laughs> So anyway, uh, but you know, what sort of limitations are we talking about uh, with these plan alternatives? So, uh, so for example, now if we have the defined contribution type plans, case, okay, so that's like a profit sharing plan or a SEP. Uh, right. The limits mm -hmm. um, for 15 and 16 uh, for an individual dollar limit is $53,000 or 100% of pay. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in a 401k plan and you're 50 and over, that can go as high as 59000 because you're allowed a $6,000 catch-up in your 401k um, for people that are 50 and over. Um, the uh, limits on the defined benefit plan are calculated by an actuary. And so those numbers can vary. There's like a maximum um, amount. So that, that's usually there's a, maximum a percentage of compensation, funding, right? right? Yeah. Well, it's a maximum funding yeah. um, that we're going to fund a retirement mm -hmm. that's going to pay a benefit of 225000 Yeah. I believe, don't quote me as the benefit limit, um, but um, that does change annually, um, and um, and it, there's a there's a real calculation by an actuary to get to that actual number. Right. So right. But you can see when we we're talking about a couple hundred thousand, it's going to be paid over the rest of somebody's lifetime. That that it's, it's that's, a pot of money that you have to have at age sixty-five. That is a lot of money. Right. Yes. Now. Um, <clears throat> And you can see why uh, some companies decided not to continue that because yes, funding when you have a large employee mm -hmm. base, yes, yeah, it became a real problem. Um, and then, uh, what about just the uh, the employee contribution uh, to, in other words, the voluntary contribution to a four hundred one k? Yes, eighteen thousand is mm -hmm. the dollar limit. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, if you're fifty and over, it can be twenty four thousand, and that's. For 2015, and then it's going to be the same in 16. Right. Since there was no cost of made it a little easier. We only had to re remember one yeah. group of numbers. <laughs> okay, let's talk a moment. What about the Roth alternative? So uh, w maybe you can explain a little bit about what's happened there. There's sort of a development just from the last uh, several just years. Just in the yeah, just in the last year, uh, actually, pretty big uh, development. Uh, Roth had been, um, you could do a Roth 401k, so you put the same amount in as you would a regular 401k, but you uh, did it with after-tax money. Works like a Roth IRA. At the mm -hmm. end, when you retire, you don't pay any taxes on the gains that happen along the way. Um, but one of the things that happened last fall was um, they allow for someone to convert their pre-tax dollars inside a plan to Roth money. Mm -hmm. um, you have to pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it allows someone to do that inside. Before, you had to have a time in which somebody was going to have a distribution to do it, but now it's allowed within the plan. Okay, and so in other words, if I, in the past, I made voluntary contributions to uh, a 401k plan. Okay, so this is not applied to the employer part. This is only the employee part. So now I've got... I mean, in a sense, two accounts. I've got the Roth account because now I've decided to start putting money in that. Yes. And then I've got this other part, uh, the accumulation of what I've done in the past. So I can elect to take a, a part or all of that uh, money that I put in the past, a little bit like you can do with an IRA, and now uh, move that to the Roth account, but as a, the, at the expense of having to pick that up into income. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and so you'll have to uh, pay the taxes for that. Yeah, one, one thing that has come up too also in some of the larger companies like Google, um, they also have it where you can do an after-tax contribution um, up to your fifty-three or $59,000 limit and then convert that to a Roth. And there, there's no tax implications. You're just able to take the benefit of um, the after-tax money being converted to a not-to-be-taxed-in-the-future type vehicle. Yeah. So, well, so 
lots of interesting uh, things here, alternatives, and that's part of what we wanted to point out to people here <coughs> in this uh, interview, is uh, to be aware of those. Um, how to, let's see here, what are the annual forms that are required to be filed for these plans, and are they included with income tax returns? have the same due dates as income tax returns? How does that part of this work? Well, as I talked about before, the Form 5500, that just happens to be the form number, yeah. like a 1040 for a uh, personal income tax return, is the plan's tax return. There's no income taxes to it. It's an informational return. That's due annually. Um, as far as anything that would be on an individual return, if somebody takes a distribution from a plan, They'll receive a 1099-R for retirement, and we'll have to include that in their um, income tax return, mm -hmm. even if it's a rollover. Mm -hmm. They have to report that they received the income. They would not be taxed on it, mm -hmm. and the 1099-R does not have a taxable amount because it was rolled over to another plan or an IRA, but it does have to be reported. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I wanted to point out to people is that... Um, the, on these Roth accounts. So there is a distinction between um, a Roth account, for example, for a Roth 401k and for an individual as far as required distributions. Correct. And, and this isn't a, really an employer concern, but it's just something to be aware of. And that is that during your lifetime, you're not required to take a distribution from a Roth IRA. Correct. But once you reach age 70 and a half, you are required to take it from your Roth 401k. Correct. So uh, what you could do to avoid that requirement is just roll your, uh, your Roth 401k that, to the IRA. Yeah, that's what we recommend to Roth. anyone is before they get to 70 and a half is mm -hmm. to roll their plan money um, into the Roth IRA, all their Roth money. Right. Another thing that I wanted to point out is we were talking about this administration requirement that of the forms. And again, this is sort of an advantage of the SEP is there's no form. No, nope, uh, there's no form. <laughs> so uh, you do have a, like a, a basic ag a agreement type form. There's an IRS form that you can use as a substitute or you can g get your own. Correct. Uh, to the effect of, of uh, who's covered and so forth. But, uh, but that's not something you have to do annually. It, you, that's how you adopt the plan and then you just go from there. Correct. <clears throat> okay, so um, I think we've got about maybe three minutes or so left here. Um, so maybe you can share a few uh, thoughts, uh, uh, words of wisdom for people in, in getting into this area of, uh, of retirement plans for a small business. Well, I, the most important thing is to make sure that you find somebody that you can work with um, that's knowledgeable in, in the area to mm -hmm. make sure that you get the correct advice and that you follow the rules correctly. You know, I would, you know, I'd recommend you talk to somebody that, you know, can do a variety of type things as far as the plan document goes and that type of thing so you can take full advantage of everything. Um, I guess, it, you know, if somebody doesn't want to take full advantage, mm -hmm. then, you know, there, like I said, there's options that are, that are limited in that type of thing. But generally speaking, you'll be on your own as far as uh, making sure, you know, the documents are taken care of. In fact, I had one case that we ended up receiving because they were with a brokerage firm and they missed updating the documents. They have to be updated every five or six years. And then they froze his account uh -oh. and he couldn't get any access until they came to someone like me who went to the correction program to get the document updated. Uh -huh. And so um, again, there's certain rules that the financial institutions are gonna have when, they, when, they, uh, when you use one of their, their documents or their accounts. Yeah. So related to all of this, um, and, and I, I don't want to slam anybody, but uh, there was a ruling quite recently, as I recall, um, I don't remember which court, it may have been the Supreme Court, but um, basically the court said that the employer could be surcharged if there were excessive uh, fees and, and limited choices for the employee. Yeah, that's the Southern California Edison case. Okay. And what they had done in that case is they're a very large plan, and they had institutional investments, but they put in some retail investments which have higher 
expense ratios in them yeah. than institutional. And they were such a large plan that the only thing they should have had in there was institutional investments. And that's what the, the case was all about. In fact, the Supreme Court was rather um, um, upset with mm. SoCal Edison for bringing it up because it was a clear-cut case that they'd made a mistake on that. Again, that's why it's important to work with, in that particular case, the financial advisors to make sure that um, it's consistent for the options that people have and the, the expense ratios are proper. Right. So now uh, there's required disclosures, as I recall, related to the expenses in these plans. Yes, that's the that's um, started about three years ago with the U.S. Department of Labor that um, different fee disclosures have to be done and provided to anybody that's in an individually directed type plan so that they make sure that what they're choosing um, they understand everything about it and mm -hmm. what expenses are involved in it. Okay. Phil, I want to thank you for coming and, uh, sure. and sharing this information with us. Folks, uh, I think that uh, this is a super important area. Uh, all of us need to plan for retirement and so I hope that uh, giving you this information and some of the choices available will be helpful. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.